Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for sticking with it. I promise to be quick. Um, thank you also to, to Maddie and to Pat for inviting me along and, and giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I suppose, listening to the, the, the last couple of speakers, there is a possibility that anything to do with hepatitis C is completely pointless, so we could all go home now. But hopefully we can try and prove something different. What I'm going to talk about is, is particularly a, a program that we're running in Reading, which we try, try to spread out at the moment, particularly looking at hepatitis C and HIV testing, but looking at trying to get to what we would call hard to reach communities. Um, I'm sure everybody's uh, really familiar with all the figures, so I'm not going to sort of labour them too much. If we look at the UK figures for HIV, I'm not going to talk too much about HIV because the outcomes from the work we've done so far hasn't actually flagged any up. Um, and I think it's, it's quite an interesting time to spend some time talking about hepatitis C because there's an awful lot going on in hepatitis C generally at the moment. So now it's quite a good time to explore that. About 91,000 people in, in the population in the UK not, uh, with, with HIV. Um, hepatitis C, this is crazy. 216 to 400,000 people. That's, that's a bit of a variation there. We can, we can have a look at that a bit later on. Um, so the prevalence in the normal population of um, HCV is, is about half a percent. If we look at the substance misuse community, in 2011 there was 102 new cases of HIV. So the cumulative total of, of all the cases of HIV in the substance misuse community ever is, is about 5,500 people. The prevalence within the injecting drug community is about 1.2% of HIV. Now statistics suggest that it, it should be about 90% infection rate for HCV. But actually talking to colleagues around, very few of us see that high level. So where that figure is coming from is, is difficult to ascertain. I suggest it's probably not UK figures. Um, and as a consequence, that may well bump it up. In addition to this, and something I'm going to touch on while we're, 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 we're sort of running through this presentation, is also the Asian community, because we see a very high prevalence of HCV in the Asian community. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is later. But when we say the, the, the Regular community is about half a percent. We're seeing about a 5% incidence of hepatitis C in the Asian community, particularly in the Pakistani community. I mentioned earlier on talking about surveillance and the, and the wide range of, of, of figures that we have for hepatitis C in the UK. Well, to get it a slightly more clear, to try and put some bones or some meat on the bones, Europe and, um, and the USA, HCV is the most common chronic liver disease. It's the reason why the majority of liver transplants are performed. And the HPA have told us, this is, this is very good information, I'm sure, that in 2010 they, they, they asked a, a number of service users um, about whether they've ever had a hepatitis C test, and 83% said yes. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? But the interesting thing is this word ever. If you're an injecting drug user, and we've, we've already talked about this this afternoon, and you're using once, twice, three times a day, what use is a hepatitis C test that you did five years ago? It's, it's, it's purposeless. So this is rubbish, really. So the, the ECDC, which is just European uh, Control of Diseases, um, have, have implemented studies for um, trying to normalise and, and rationalise our figures for HIV across the whole of Europe by giving everybody the same sort of monitoring structure. Um, and that was put in place in 2009. In, in 2012, we still don't have a pan-European way of measuring hepatitis C. So until we get some sort of standard protocol across Europe, we aren't really going to get a clear idea of how many hepatitis C cases there really are. We talk about hard-to-reach communities and substance misuse is, is certainly one of those hard-to-reach communities when it comes to testing. And we need to think about why that is. Why is it difficult to get testing with our service users? Well, we've had a, a lot of people this afternoon particularly talking about knowledge. And knowledge is a, is a problem because there are two types of knowledge. There's knowledge that is absent, and there's knowledge that's just rubbish. And unfortunately, in the substance misuse community, there's a lot of people that put out a lot of information that is quite incorrect. So people don't really understand the risk of transmission of bloodborne viruses properly. And they, they have some very interesting sort of myths about how it can and can't be transmitted. Certainly when I first started in Reading, I sat down with a long-term speed user who actually told me that the, that the fact of the matter was he didn't need to be screened because didn't you know that speed users can't actually get hep C? Another one told me, it's okay, I've had a test, I'm hep C antibody positive, which means I'm immune, so we don't have to worry about it. So we have to challenge the knowledge. 
A lot of people are fearful of coming forward for testing. They might be fearful of what the outcome is or what the, the response is to the outcome. But that also links into mistrust. That they're scared about coming forward to services because they're, they're worried about what's going to happen to the information that we get, what's going to happen to the information about them, what are we going to do with them. For a, a number of our service users, <coughs> testing, as we spoke spoken earlier on, is not a priority. Um, and, and health is generally not a prior, priority. For many of our service users, they have sort of a, a non-health-centric paradigm. And to try and put some bones on what that means is, we used to run a, a nurse-led GP service for unhoused community in Reading. And I had one of my, my, my guys came in one day, and he said, oh, he says, I've got a bit of a problem here. He said, I've hurt my arm. I said, oh, what's up? Let's have a look at it. And it was sort of like the shape of a, a, a dinner fork. I said, that would appear to be broken. Better get you up in the hospital. I'll call you an ambulance. And he said, no, 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 no. I don't need an ambulance. I can get up there. So I said, OK, I'll tell you what. I'll hop in the car. We'll take you up there. No, 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 fine. I know where accident said this. I'll go up there now. So we've got a guy with a broken arm, an acute broken arm. And so we, we immobilised it, we put it in a sling for him and sent him off to Accident Centre. Two days later, he arrived at Accident Centre, which was about a quarter of a mile away. But he'd met a guy on, on the corner of the street loading 20 quid, so they went off and they slipped the 20 quid, got a couple of bags, used those, met someone else, had a drink with them. It took two days to actually get to the hospital with the broken arm. And that's primarily because his broken arm wasn't actually a priority for him. There were other things that are much more important. And I think it's going back to what was being spoken about ritual earlier on. Sometimes the language doesn't work. Now, that might either be the, the, the communities that we're working with who don't speak the language that we speak, or it may well be that we talk in tongues. And unfortunately, the medical and nursing profession, particularly in blood-borne viruses, is incredibly good at talking in tongues. You know, in the early days of HIV, we had two different studies going on in HIV, <coughs> one in France, one in America, both studying the same virus but calling it, calling it different things because that way they didn't have to share their evidence. A lot of our, our patients don't want to come forward or they're scared about testing because they've got poor veins. If they've got one vein that's fairly good access, the last thing they want is an idiot like me digging around with a big green needle, ruining for them. Or they're scared that people are going to challenge them over their poor access. And talking of poor access, is limited access to service provision. Often testing is not available when our service users need testing. So, you know, running it in office hours or whatever is not always the best thing for our service users. And why is that? Well, historically, testing has been based on a medical model. It's all about doctors and nurses. We're trained in blood-borne viruses, we're trained in taking consent, we can collect specimens, we can stick pins in places you couldn't believe you could stick pins in and draw blood off, um, and we can make referrals. And that's very important because when it comes to referring someone on, a lot of medical professionals don't want to talk to anybody that's not a medical professional. You're a lay person, what on earth do you know? We must do it through the right channels. Um, so the difficulty is that when we employ that, Time can be limited from the point of view of getting people into clinic. The cost is high because doctors and nurses generally are pretty expensive. And there's a limited number of personnel. So it's quite restrictive from the point of view of, of what we can offer. So is there anything else we can do? <coughs> well, the National Treatment Agency says to us that we should try and screen all engaged service users on a yearly basis for HIV and Hep C. Could do. Efforts should be made to improve the levels of awareness and testing for members of the Asian community, particularly the Pakistani community. We've got to try and look at how we can do that. Um, and if we as service providers are going to meet these challenges, we're going to have to change something. But the question has to be, what is it we change? Well, I would argue what we've been trying to do in, in, in Reading and the project that we've been working on at the moment is actually changing everything. We, we've looked at the whole service and we've looked at what we can do to change it. So if we want to move towards a service user-led provision, we've got to challenge some of the things that are entrenched in our testing protocols. First of all, the test itself. We either do a venous blood test or we do a dry blood spot test. Now, I'm sorry, both of these are as bad as each other. And I know there are a shed load of people that think dry blood spot tests are the second coming. But I'm afraid from my point of view in this service user group, I don't think they're that useful. And the reason for that is that, number one, both of these require blood, both of these require sharps, 
Both of these require disposable, uh, disposal of, of, of sharks and also the potential risk of transmission of virus. And all of them, I'm afraid, require you to come back to get your results. So there is nothing spontaneous about either of these. The other thing to remember is that standard protocol for any bloodborne virus is you get a reactive result and you have to repeat it. So whatever test you do as a preliminary test, the second test is always going to be a blood test anyway. So this is not helpful. Once you get a person in, they're motivated, they want to have a test, we'll go ahead and do the test. We might dig around in a vein. We might do a bright, bright blood spot. This one I can turn around in about five days. This one, they claim it's about a week, sometimes it's up to three. can be a bit challenging when the, you know, the, the punter comes back and says, have you got my result? No, it hasn't turned up in the post yet. Okay, we can get a lot of information from it, but we can get a lot of information in other ways as well. The other thing is we need to challenge, do we actually need doctors and nurses to do tests? I'm not entirely sure that we do. And actually, do we need clinics? Again, <coughs> I'm not entirely sure we need clinics. Certainly when I worked in India, my clinic was an upturned uh, milk crate and we had a wall made out of a sheet and it was in a car park. It worked perfectly well. So we can break the mould <coughs> of standard testing. We've got a new structure. And if we're going to employ a new structure, we need a new paradigm. We need to think about this completely differently. We need to consider point of care testing, and point of care testing is working opportunistically. It's about working at the time, at the moment, and seizing that moment and getting as much from it as we can. Let's use key workers. Now, we've employed a program called BBD Champions, and I'm going to talk about that for a little while. And this is our first cohort of champions. We need a mobile and a flexible service. It's got to be a service that's built around service user needs. But if that's going to happen, We've got to have clear, robust, unified protocols. And we've got to have a robust referral pathway that's built around service user support. It's no good saying, OK, you've got a, react you know, a reactive result. Have a nice day. We've got to be able to do something, and we've got to be able to support our service users. Point of care testing. Well, we, we're using the Oroquip HIV and Hep C test. You've seen the stand out there, and it works very well. It's an opportunistic test. So when we work or when we engage with a service user, we can actually identify, are they receptive to having a test at that moment on that day? If they are, then we can go ahead and do the test. We'll sit them down, talk about the test, we'll take cons consent, we'll explain the procedure, and they will go ahead and do the test there and then. It's a simple mouth swab using oral fluid. You then sit around for 25 minutes, you can have a cup of tea, you can spend some time doing harm minimization, you can spend some time doing lifestyle work, and then you've got a result. It's a provisional result, just like any other uh, uh, you know, first line test is going to be. But you've got a result that's either reactive or non-reactive, and we've got something that we can work with. A lot of people don't like on-the-spot tests, they certainly don't like um, oral swabs because you know they're not using blood or whatever, the sensitivity is 100%, specificity is 99.8. At the end of the day, I don't mind getting a few false positives if I don't get any false negatives. And you don't get false negatives with this, you might get the odd false positive, but then you do an ELISA test, so that's not really a problem. Most importantly, it's non-invasive, there is no risk of infection, there is no cost for disposal, there are no sharps, and you haven't got to be a doctor or a nurse to do it. So it's got to be a good system. But how can we link that system into providing a better testing service? We need to think about who else can do testing. Unfortunately, this is, this is me in my younger days and in a previous job, and that was on a very nice boat on Lake Victoria. And they said to me, you've got to go out and work on an island, and um, you need to get from island to island. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Dugout, canoe, and hippopotamuses. This is going to be terrific. And they turned up with a speedboat with two outboard engines on the back and said, can you use this? And I went, yes. They said, well, we can't. Off you go. So it was, it was very nice indeed. If I, if I had my water skis with me, it would have been bloody brilliant. So what is really needed? Do we need doctors and nurses to run a service? Not necessarily. No, we don't. When I was working in Africa, I was rolling out antiretroviral drugs. And the problem with those was a lot of people didn't understand how they worked. They didn't understand what the regime should be. And we had very few people prescribing them. So often clinics were maybe two or three days bicycle ride away from where you lived, and as a consequence, people used to die on the way to clinics unnecessarily. So what we needed to do was to try and raise people's awareness at community level. 
And the way we did this was by, by teaching village elders about HIV and about antiretroviral drugs. And what they would do was they could actually triage people that needed to be in clinic and support those that didn't need to be in clinic. And what we've basically done is copied that into Reading and looked at who are the most appropriate people to do the job. If we're working in a substance misuse community, who are the people who know the service users best, who are trained communicators, who have an ability to work on a rapport with these people and seem to understand it in, in, in the right setting and have a clinical service or a service provision that's built around their needs. And that's got to be the key workers. So why don't we just train key workers up to do the test? Seems logical and that's what we've done. It allows us to have a spont spontaneous service. So when a service user comes in, they can be triaged, they can be going there for a needle exchange, they can be there for any reason at all. If at that time they want to have a test done, it is there, it is available and it is offered to them. We don't test on Friday afternoons and apart from that we, we have some sort of control set up or some sort of structure in each agency that allows people to access testing when they want it. It's agency based so we've trained a number of agency or key workers from agencies to work but the core component of this is that it's not about the agency, it's about the programme. So if you want to subscribe to this and work as a BDV champion, we all share information. There's no competition, there's no secret squirrel. The service now has actually gone mobile. So these are two of our guys that work in, in floating support. And that is the Hep C testing clinic. It's all in there and it can be used in the service user's home, it can be used in a car park, it can be used down by the canal, it doesn't matter where it is. We can offer a test, we can give a result and we can link people into service. We've also now started to offer the um, awareness of the BBB Champions Project at, at events and going into institutions. So how does it work and, and how do we keep our standards up? Well we have a commonality throughout it, so there's a core training programme, it's workbook based, we have workshops and we have a lot of uh, structure whereby we bring existing BBB champions in and they get involved in the training. We have a buddying system so experienced champions work with new champions so they bring themselves up to speed and nobody is felt unsupported and we have clinical supervision for all those that are in, um, involved. The protocol means that we have one structure, it doesn't matter what the agency is, we encourage joined up working. And all of the champions manage their, their, their all, all the agencies manage their champions, but the DAC manages the project. So we get all the information back and that helps with our statistics. We report to public health and we get a common data collection, so we're getting some good information about basically how many people we've got. We've got 12 champions trained. We've actually got four of them testing for various reasons out of two agencies. The Hep C testing actually went from 80 tests in the, in the preceding year to 200 tests in the first year of the Champions. <coughs> so that was me working on my own. This was our new Champions coming in. Of those 32 of our, champ, uh, of our uh, service users tested uh, reacted to Hep C, 28 were PCR positive and three were acute. And it's very rare you ever pick up acute hepatitis C, but it's very valuable if you can pick it up because they respond very well to treatment. So 25% of those, those people identified are now actually undergoing a course of standard treatment and the remainder are actually engaged with alcohol reduction. Now the interesting thing, and picking up what you were saying earlier on, is that you can talk to people about hepatitis C and you can get a positive or a reactive result and they won't do anything with it. Our experience is every single service user that got a reactive result has actually engaged better with, with um, drug provision service. So we've got something positive out of that as well. The outcome from a cost, it's actually a very cost effective program. If you look at the, the, the cost of, of a lab set against the point of care test, you can see the lab slightly cheaper. But you haven't got to pay for transportation, you haven't got to pay for insurances, you haven't got to pay for nurses. So this is a service that works in a, in a, a very cost effective way and we're getting immediate results and those people that are found to be reactive are simply referred into service as they normally would be using any other test. The key, or key workers are already employed, so in, that's not costing us any more, but interesting that the, this is a, an enhancement of their, their role, and as a consequence, we're actually getting a better retention of key workers as a consequence of this. So generally speaking, this is a, a very positive program. At the end of the se second year, we've now got 65 champions, seven agencies, 
We now have an Asian ladies group, and this is really the one that, that I'm excited about because I talked earlier on about the Asian community having a high incidence of hepatitis C. We now have eight Asian housewives who are actually running their own testing service. And as, as a consequence, that's run in Urdu, it's run in, in Punjabi, and again, they link into the services required. Why is this useful? Because there are new hep C treatments available, and they work. I know there was a suggestion earlier on that there's no cure for hep C. I'm sorry, yes, there is. And it's very effective. It's not particularly nice, it's, it's, it's effective. And when you think end-stage liver disease costs 4,000 a day in hospitalisation, <coughs> it's cost-effective as well. We can reduce comorbidities, and there has been anecdotal evidence that says one person with, who injects drugs who's successfully treated for hep C can prevent 10 more infections. And that's got to be good news. I know we're running out of time, so I'm simply going to say thank you to Denise, who's my boss from the BAT, and also to my colleagues at the Royal Barks. Invertech and Oroshore have been very supportive, as have Roche. And also very grateful to Tamina, who's in the audience, who's the leader of the, the Asian ladies, and is absolutely brilliant, to Miriam and to Jules, and obviously to the champions, thank you very much. <laughs>